Welcome back to this next video in which we are discussing the parathyroid glands and vitamin D. Okay, so we're in the process of talking about the effects of parathyroid hormone and 1,25-dihydroxyvitamin D on the bone. Okay, we know what the effect is going to be. It's going to be that bone resorption is increased uh, so that uh, we release calcium from the bone where it's stored in the uh, bone mineral hydroxyapatite of the bone. Uh, and into the blood, where of course it's going to raise the free calcium concentration in the blood and therefore help to restore us to uh, a healthy blood calcium concentration. Okay, so, uh, we have discussed then osteoblasts and osteoclasts which are involved in the bone remodeling process. I remember, osteoblasts are the ones which are continuously making bone, and osteoclasts are the ones which are degrading bone. Okay, and usually the two uh, processes are in equilibrium. What parathyroid hormone and 1,25-dihydroxyvitamin D are going to do is they're going to shift it towards the bone resorption process. They're going to increase the osteoclast activity and decrease the osteoblast activity. Now, as I said at the end of the previous video, this is done in a way that you wouldn't predict uh, if you were to come up with uh, a means for this to happen. So if you were to design this, uh, you wouldn't most likely design what I'm about to tell you is the way that it occurs. So parathyroid hormone and 1,25-dihydroxy vitamin D are actually going to increase osteoclast activity by acting on osteoblasts, and they're going to basically get the osteoblasts to tell osteoclasts to increase their activity. And indeed, the osteoblasts are going to call for more osteoclasts to be made, and also they're going to actually activate the osteoclasts that are already there. And what I want to do now is give you a brief description of how this is actually going to occur. So we'll need some more paper, uh, and then we'll go. Right, so, uh, the parathyroid hormone then, of course, is going to act on parathyroid hormone 1 receptors on the surface of the osteoblasts, and the 1,25-dihydroxyvitamin D is going to act on vitamin D receptors, okay? Uh, now, I should just say that there is a parathyroid hormone type 2 receptor, uh, however, its physiological purpose isn't really known, it doesn't uh, play much part in the actual parathyroid hormone signaling. The parathyroid hormone type 1 receptor is the main one. Okay, so let's just summarise this into a flow diagram then. So, uh, parathyroid hormone then is going to act on the type 1 parathyroid hormone receptor, so P2A, sorry, PTH, uh, 1R, and 125-dihydroxyvitamin uh, D is going to act on the vitamin D receptor, that nuclear receptor, and this is occurring in the osteoblast. So these receptors are on the osteoblast. So I'll just draw a picture of my osteoblast here, okay, which is on the surface of the bone, like so. So let's just add a little bit of colour on here. So 125-dihydroxyvitamin D acts on the vitamin D receptor, which is this nuclear receptor inside the osteoblast uh, nucleus, and that's going to change osteoblast behaviour by changing gene expression within the osteoblast. The parathyroid hormone, meanwhile, is going to work on a surface G-protein coupled receptor to again change the behaviour of the osteoblast. Now, what are the changes then in the behaviour that the osteoblast is going to uh, uh, show us? Uh, well, one of them is it's going to start releasing a molecule which is going to call for more osteoclasts. So I said that the osteoblasts are now going to call for more osteoclasts so that we increase our osteoclast population. And the molecule, well, a principal example of a molecule that they're going to release in order to call for osteoclasts is something known as macrophage colony stimulating factor, uh, often abbreviated down to MCSF like so. So the M here stands for macrophage, an extremely important uh, cell in the immune system. And then CSF, if you've ever studied immunology, you'll know uh, what this stands for, colony stimulating factor. Okay, so macrophage colony stimulating factor then is going to act on the cells of the hematopoietic system. So this is the first piece of understanding we need to have. Where do osteoclasts come from?
Well, the cells that make osteoclasts, which are called pre-osteoclasts, because remember, an osteoclast is this massive, multinucleated cell that's made by the fusion of loads of other cells. The cells which make them are called pre-osteoclasts. Where do those actually come from? Well, they come from the hematopoietic lineage. They come from the same um, stem cell that creates all the cells of the blood, so the hematopoietic stem cell, okay, which creates things like erythrocytes, red blood cells, all of the leukocytes, the white blood cells of the body, uh, including, for instance, macrophages, okay, and also, of course, uh, megakaryocytes, which then make platelets. So, um, we are, th that explains to a little extent why we are releasing this macrophage colony stimulating factor, which you might have come across in uh, studying inflammation or the immune system, uh, is a molecule which can go and stimulate hematopoietic, the hematopoietic system to produce immune cells. Okay, so pre-osteoclasts are going to come from the same cells. Now, those of you who do have a little bit of experience with the hematopoietic system, and I will just draw out a hematopoietic stem cell here. So, we're going to uh, this molecule, macrophage colony stimulating factor, which the osteoblasts have released. This is going to go to the bone marrow, where there is located an extremely important stem cell. Uh, well, not just one, but an extremely important type of stem cell, known as the hematopoietic stem cell. And these things divide and divide and divide, and some of their progeny remain as hematopoietic stem cells, so that um, the population of hematopoietic stem cells is maintained, and some of their progeny will then go through differentiation processes and become uh, the cells uh, of the blood. Uh, so the red blood cells, the leukocytes, the white blood cells, uh, and uh, the platelets. Okay, now, those of you who do know something about the hematopoietic system will know that it is horrendously complicated. Okay, and it's horrendously disagreed upon. If you go to different textbooks and try and find uh, the different stages of differentiation of the different types of cells that the hematopoietic system can create, you will find different diagrams in different textbooks, in different articles. Everyone seems to have their own account of how differentiation works in the hematopoietic system. It's a total nightmare trying to make sense of it. So I am not going to attempt to make sense of it here. I am just going to give you the raw facts. Okay, and the raw fact is this. Osteoblasts, when acted upon by parathyroid hormone and 125-dihydroxyvitamin D, are going to start releasing this molecule, macrophage colony stimulating factor. This goes off and affects certain cells of the hematopoietic system, whether it's actually the hematopoietic stem cell itself, or whether it's a progeny of the hematopoietic stem cell that are further along in the differentiation process, but are still uh, not finished, they're not complete, they're not, they haven't finished the differentiation process. Um, I don't know. But that it's going to go off and to the bone marrow and affect cells of the hematopoietic system, and the overall result is that you are going to get pre-osteoclasts, more pre-osteoclasts, these cells which are going to fuse together to make osteoclasts arriving back at the bone. Okay? That's the uh, start point and the end point, the uh, cause and effect, if you like, with all of the bit in the middle cut out, because as I say, if you go to different places, you'll get different answers, so it's a nightmare to try and make sense of it. There isn't, uh, no one can agree with regards to the hematopoietic system. Okay, so, overall then, this macrophage colony stimulating factor, which the osteoblasts have released is going to result in an increase in the production of pre-osteoclasts by the hematopoietic system. Okay, so you're now going to get these cells which are going to fuse together to make osteoclasts, known as pre-osteoclasts, which are more normal cells in that they just have a single nucleus here. Okay, so this is representing a pre-osteoclast here. You're going to get lots of these now arriving, and they are, of course, going to be able to fuse together to make osteoclasts on the surface of the bone. Okay, so, macrophage colony stimulating factor then, it's what is driving the hematopoietic stem cell system to actually produce as more pre-osteoclasts. 
Now what I want to talk about is how do pre-osteoclasts actually form osteoclasts. Well, the osteoblasts have a big role in this as well. So, in order for pre-osteoclasts to fuse together to make an osteoclast, so this process here where we're actually going to make our giant osteoclast on the surface of bone, so here it is with its multiple different nuclei here, this process requires the preosteoclast to be stimulated by a certain molecule, and I'll talk about this molecule in just a moment because this molecule is going to be um, produced by the osteoblasts that have been stimulated by the parathyroid hormone and the 125-dihydroxy vitamin D. Okay, so here's our final osteoclast, which has been made from lots of preosteoclasts fusing together to make this giant multinucleated cell here. Okay, so what do the preosteoclasts then need to be stimulated with to make them form osteoclasts? Well, they need to be stimulated with something known as rank L or rank ligand. Okay, so rank L like so. Uh, so this stands for, as I say, rank ligand, and I'll tell you in a moment what rank actually stands for. But this is a really simple name because it's literally just saying it's this is the name of the receptor and this is the ligand for that receptor. So we have called this molecule the ligand for the receptor that it binds to. Okay, so rank is a receptor that's going to be on the surface of the uh, preosteoclasts. In fact, I might as well tell you this now. So on the surface of the preosteoclasts, you're going to have an important receptor known as the rank receptor. Okay, so in green here, this is the rank receptor. And what does it actually stand for? It stands for the receptor activator of nuclear factor kappa B, NF kappa B. So this stands for, R is for receptor, okay, the A is then for activator, and the NK is for of nuclear factor kappa B, which is usually just abbreviated down to NF kappa B, like so. But if you wanted to uh, say this, it, give it its full name, it is the nuclear factor, that's what NF stands for. This is the Greek letter kappa, and then it's kappa B, so this is, I will write it out in full just once. So this is the nuclear factor, and then that's the Greek letter, that little K, uh, is the Greek letter kappa, it's supposed to be the Greek letter kappa anyway, and then it's the nuclear factor kappa B, uh, a really important uh, transcription factor. Okay, so the receptor activator of nuclear factor kappa B. So this is a receptor which is going to activate the nuclear factor kappa B, which will change uh, gene uh, expression within the cell and therefore change cellular behaviour. Okay, but often because this is a total mouthful, it's just referred to as the rank. Okay, so the molecule which binds to this, the ligand for this, is then just called rank ligand, and that's usually just uh, denoted rank L like so, so I'll colour in rank L in blue. Okay, so the preosteoclast then, they have this rank receptor on their surface, and if that uh, rank is stimulated by the rank ligand, then the preosteoclast will start to fuse together to form an osteoclast, so it's the binding of the rank ligand to the rank on the surface of these preosteoclasts, which gives the preosteoclasts this signal to tell them to start fusing together to form osteoclasts. Okay, and the rank ligand is going to be produced by the osteoblasts in response to uh, being stimulated by parathyroid hormone and being stimulated by 125-dihydroxy vitamin D. Okay, now there are two different forms of rank ligand. There is a secreted form that they can produce and also a surface receptor form that they can produce. So they can actually produce a form of rank ligand which is actually attached to their cell membranes. They will produce both forms and both forms will be stimulating the rank uh, proteins on the surface of the preosteoclasts and therefore stimulating the preosteoclasts to fuse together to make osteoclasts. Okay, in addition, the actual osteoclasts themselves have rank proteins on their surface, and the rank ligand that the osteoblasts are producing will actually also be stimulating the rank proteins on the surface of the osteoclasts. And when the rank proteins are stimulated on the surface of the osteoclast, this is going to trigger the osteoclast to increase their activity. So not only are we going to form more osteoclasts, but we're also going to activate those osteoclasts that we actually have. So this is going to 
uh, activate our osteoclast here, so it results in the activation. Okay, so there we go. Let's now summarize all of this and put this all together so that we completely understand this. So, parathyroid hormone and 125-dihydroxy vitamin D. They are going to result in increased bone resorption and that will release the calcium from the bone mineral into the bloodstream and that will help to bring calcium level back up. How do they actually do it? Well, parathyroid hormone and 125-dihydroxy vitamin D, although it doesn't seem particularly logical, they actually act on the osteoblasts, the bone-forming cells, rather than the osteoclasts, which are uh, the bone-resorbing cells. Okay, so parathyroid hormone will act through the parathyroid hormone 1 receptor, uh, and 125-dihydroxy vitamin D will, of course, act through the vitamin D receptor. They'll change the osteoblast behavior, and what do the osteoblasts do? Well, firstly, they release uh, this molecule, macrophage colony stimulating factor, which goes to the hematopoietic system in the bone marrow and triggers the hematopoietic system to produce more pre-osteoclast. So that's the overall result. Uh, yes, we haven't gone into the detail there because, as I say, it's a total nightmare, so we're just going to have cause and effect. So the osteoblasts release this cry, this macrophage cognitive stimulating factor saying we need more preosteoclasts and the bone marrow uh, system, the hematopoietic system, produces more preosteoclasts. Okay, they're now going to arrive at the surface of the bone and now in order to get the preosteoclasts to actually fuse together and become osteoclasts on the surface of the bone, you need to stimulate the rank proteins, the receptor activator of nuclear factor kappa B proteins on the surface of the preosteoclast with the ligand for rank, which is the rank ligand, just often abbreviated to rank L. Now there are two forms of rank ligand, a secretive form and a uh, surface bound form, a membrane bound form. The osteoblasts in response to parathyroid hormone and 125-dihydroxy vitamin D are going to produce both forms, and both forms are going to be involved in stimulating the pre-osteoclasts to fuse into osteoclasts. So that increases your population of osteoclasts. In addition, you're going to activate all of the osteoclasts so that they uh, resorb bone even more than they would normally, okay, and this is again done through the same receptor. So the osteoclasts, of course, end up with uh, rank on their surface because after all they are just made by the fusion of the pre-osteoclasts, and when the rank ligand stimulates the rank proteins on the surface of the osteoclasts, it's going to activate those osteoclasts so that they resorb bone uh, with more rigor than they would normally. So, both of those things, the increase in the population of osteoclasts and the increase in the activity of the osteoclasts is going to therefore mean that more bone is resorbed now than previously and we've had no change in the amount of bone deposition that we've got, so of course that means that the balance has been distorted towards the resorption and therefore we're going to be resorbing bone, releasing the calcium from that bone which will go into the bloodstream and help to bring calcium back up. So there is the uh, effect on bone to try and uh, end this hypocalcemia. Now, the final thing we have left to discuss is the effect on the gastrointestinal tract. Now, parathyroid hormone doesn't have any effect directly on the gastrointestinal tract. It is 125-dihydroxy vitamin D that is going to tell the gastrointestinal tract that it has to do something, and what it's going to tell it to do is absorb more calcium next time we get a good meal, and also absorb more phosphate, because remember the kidneys have chucked loads of phosphate away, so we now uh, need to repair uh, that temporary uh, measure that we had to take to try and raise calcium very quickly. Okay, so we'll talk about the effects on the gastrointestinal system of 125-dihydroxy vitamin D in the next video.